We landed in Colombo, like most travelers do. Here, the tourist routes usually split and the capital gets ignored by short-term visitors. Yet the city is the melting pot in the heart of the country. There, you can see the traces of its fascinating past and its newly born present. The original name of Colombo is Cola Amba, meaning a leaf of a mango tree. At first glance, the city has little to do with mango trees today, but there is more to Colombo than ultra-modern hotels and the Chinese-built Lotus Tower. We stayed in a small family hotel filled with antique colonial furniture. A short trip in a tuk-tuk brought us to the heart of the city, with its fascinating temples. In every country, religious sites hold the most important spots in any urban setting. These are always the places of silence and respect, and the doors are open to any being who is eager to enter with regard to the local way of life. By going to these places, we touch the soul of the people. I love to sit in the corner, contemplate, observe the locals, and get to know them in this non-verbal way. After temples, I never miss the history museums, especially in the country like Sri Lanka, which did such a great job with preserving its cultural past. Oh, I forgot to mention, I travel with a five-year-old, so alas, these museum trips are rather short for now. And before we knew, we found ourselves enjoying one of the favorite pastimes of the locals in Colombo, strolling along Gali Face Green. But well, we were short-term visitors too, so just after one day it was time to say goodbye to Colombo and take the most famous transport of the country, the train. Sri Lanka is home to one of the most beautiful train journeys in the world. Of course we took that epic route as well, but I'll show it to you a little later. For now, we wanted to take a train not as a tourist experience, but actually as a way to get where we needed. Sri Lankan railways are organized, friendly and clean, and they're not in a rush either. Our four-hour trip turned into a six-hour trip and took us to one of its historical capitals, Polonaruva. Polonaru is the second oldest capital in Sri Lanka. It became the residence of the kings after the destruction of Anuradhapura. As the legend goes, one of the reasons to move the capital was because there were less mosquitoes in Polonaruva area. Uh, well, I'm definitely not sure about that one. Now it's a vast site with plenty of temples and Buddhist structures, mostly dating back to the 12th century. It's also a famous pilgrimage site for Buddhists from all around the world. And the best way to explore Polonaruva is by bicycle. We surely got lost a few times and cursed the heat as it was getting closer to noon. Our five-year-old co-pilot thought she was on a treasure hunt with all the excitement, but eventually the heat got to her as well. We had to cut our cycling tour just 30 minutes short. Even a big adventure was waiting for us on the same day. Ancient monuments are not the only thing that north-central Sri Lanka is famous for. This part of the country is a hotspot for elephants. So much that if you travel, you should be really careful not to bump into an elephant on the road. Wild elephant sightings are not uncommon. Just after our bicycle ride, we headed straight to the famous national park Adula to witness a unique wildlife event called the Gathering. Each year, around August and early September, elephants migrate in large herds. And if you're lucky, you can watch as many as over 200 elephants in one spot, close to the water source. We did not get that lucky, but yes, we counted around 50 elephants at once, and it's absolutely incredible to watch these giants in their natural habitat. Of course, each safari has a flip side as well. And as much as I love all wildlife adventures, I sometimes do wonder, how big is the difference between the modern safaris and the zoos, really? All I can do is respect the animal kingdom, where I'm a guest, and try not to disturb them in my hunt for a perfect Instagram shot. Wildlife experience is simply addictive, and it's hard to find an island as small as Sri Lanka where you can meet so many wild animals so close. Right after hanging out with the elephants, we headed straight to the coast to fulfill one of my biggest dreams, seeing the whales. We went to the east coast because it was raining cats and dogs in the west. And that's the beauty of Sri Lanka. When it's raining on one side of the island, it's mostly sunny on the other. We stayed at Nilaveli, a quiet beach away from the crowds with not much to do. Lots of travelers go snorkeling to Pigeon Island from here, but its reputation has gone down in recent years. And one thing that nobody tells you is that how much you'll see under the sea will depend on visibility. When we traveled, visibility was not good. That's why we opted for diving and at a different part of the reef. What we saw has exceeded all expectations. 
It was my first diving experience and it was not as easy as it looks now. I'll make a separate video about it. Just make sure to subscribe not to miss it. Yet my main purpose of this trip was a sunrise boat trip to hopefully see dolphins and whales. Well, I didn't have high hopes of seeing them because it really depends on luck and we were traveling in the end of the season already, so I honestly didn't know what to expect. I was just enjoying the early morning sun, admiring big shades of water, when suddenly this happened. Dozens of dolphins swimming along, flirting with us and just being the most playful creatures in the world. And then the whales appeared. When I saw it, I literally cried. I was overpowered by joy and gratitude for the chance to witness this wonder. I thought I could stay on the boat forever. But well, even dolphins have their schedule. Eventually they faded into the depth of the ocean and it was time for us to head back. Different seasons attract visitors to different parts of the country. During monsoon, many travelers flock to the cultural sites in the central province, away from the coast, and that's exactly what we did. Sigiriya, or the Lion Rock, is an ancient rock fortress. It was the residence of King Kashiapa, and later it was used as a Buddhist monastery. It's a steep climb to the top, and we hired a local guide to hear more about the legends of the place from the locals. King Kashiapa was famous for his many wives, whose images it's believed you can still see in the caves. Though it's more for theory than a fact. Sigiri is also famous because of its links to Ramayana, an epic from ancient India. It's believed that the Lion Rock was the palace of Ravan, who was hiding Sita there. And it happened thousands of years before the King Kashyapa. What one can't deny is that Sigiri is a real wonder. The rock on which the fort is built looks completely out of place among the lush greenery and plains. Historians still have open questions. How such a structure was possible in those times? And what kind of machinery was used? Once you reach the top of the rock, the theory that it was built by aliens doesn't seem so unrealistic anymore. After Sigiriya, another historical jewel was on our way, Dambula Cave Temple, the best preserved ancient temple complex in Sri Lanka, with 153 Buddha statues inside. Looking at the ancient paintings, I could not help but feel how people who were creating the art on the walls were feeling in the process. Like the mandala art, I could feel the meditative state which was reached with a visual repetition created by hand. All I wanted to do was to stay inside with my gaze on the walls and the ceiling and with my head clear of thoughts. But being still is a luxury for a tourist. So eventually we had to jump back into the car and head towards Kandy, the darling among culture lovers. Kandy was the last capital of the ancient king's era in Sri Lanka. Visually, the city is as far from Colombo as it can be. It's located between the hills surrounded by tea plantations far away from the coast. My personal highlight from Kandy were its hotels. Sri Lanka is world famous for its architects and furniture designers. When I travel, I use it as a chance to try on a different lifestyle, which I can't live otherwise in my normal life, so I always look for boutique family hotels or for old hotels that literally brief history. There is a small travel hack for history lovers like me. Most of historical and grand hotels are actually open for the public and if you can't stay in them, you can always pass by for lunch or even for a cup of tea. That's exactly what we did and spent an afternoon in one of the oldest hotels of the country. For a moment, I felt like a guest of the Grand Budapest Hotel. Kandy is most famous for the Temple of the Tooth, the cultural performances and its royal botanical gardens. In fact, the botanical gardens were our first stop in the city. The regions of the gardens date back to the 14th century, and now it's a living, thriving collection of trees, flowers, and medicinal plants. I could be lost for days among the grand trees and neatly manicured flower beds. While roaming around, at times I felt I was in the tropical forest, and the next moment I felt like a queen strolling among the perfectly manicured royal gardens. Sadly, we only had one full day in Kandy, so as much as I wanted to keep lazing in botanical gardens, two other must-do things in Kandy were on the list. First, the Temple of the Tooth visit, a temple where it's believed that Tooth of Buddha is kept. The relic made a long journey, though, having traveled through India and Sri Lanka. The temple has also survived a major bomb blast in 1998. Sadly, a large part of original architecture was lost. But what Kandy is also most famous for is for being the getaway to the Central Highlands. 
Andy is exactly the place where one of the most beautiful train journeys in the world starts from. The train journey from Kandy to LA is about 7 hours and it takes you through large green hills, waterfalls, tea gardens and bridges. What struck me in Sri Lanka is how friendly this country is for travelers. To the extent that the train, which is actually just a normal train taking people from point A to point B, always stopped or slowed down at the most picturesque viewpoints, so that everyone could enjoy the view. For the entire 7 hours, the greenery and the views and the turns and twists of the train just don't stop. They say one side of the train has a better view than the other, but it's not really true. It depends on the part of the route. This train route is usually booked out and packed. In the second and third class, the doors are always open, but you mostly need to stand in the queue to actually get a spot for the best enjoyment. You see, everyone wants that perfect Instagram shot. There is a small trick though. After the initial two hours of the ride, the excitement goes down and even the biggest social media stars get tired of standing at the windy entrance. So halfway through the trip, hooray! You can enjoy the wind and the doors without the social pressure. All along, I couldn't help but wonder, how do locals feel seeing the daily train going through some tiny villages and tea gardens with people hanging out of every single door with selfie sticks pointing in all directions? If you wonder about the safety of this adventure, I have to disappoint you. As much as it seems that everyone does it and nothing happens, it's not true. So by the middle of the journey, I found that my happy spot is by the window. And like a delighted puppy on his first car ride, I kept my head out of the window through the entire trip, soaking up the views and getting face massage by the warm winds. The main spot for the travelers is Ella, a touristy town in the highlands. From here, travelers go on hikes, visit tea factories and gardens, hop between waterfalls and caves, or just chill, enjoying the cool, clean air. If you can drive a scooter confidently, then hills and mountains are best explored on a two-wheeler. Well, at least when you're a passenger. The most iconic image of this part of the country is the Nine Arch Bridge. Tourists adjust their visits to the train timetable and surround the bridge at the top and at the bottom to watch the train passing by. Surely we did the same. After getting lost and undertaking a slippery route which made our butts all brown, we took the best spot. It looks unreal, like one of those places where time has stopped. An image that can only appear in a movie that is in a black and white one. Yet here it is, the real route of the real train. And if you ever take this train, you'll probably be in the most amount of Instagram posts without anyone realizing it. As touristy as LA is, you still have a chance to find some deserted places off the beaten path. My favorite spot was the Ravana cave and the temple nearby. A lot of people online complain that it's just a cave, <laughs> but I had a special interest in it because of its alleged links to Ramayana. They say that was the cave where Ravana kept Sita, but outside the legends, there is something else that makes this cave, and in fact the entire range so special. This cave is linked to various spots of the island through the secret tunnels dug through the mountains. Like, one of the tunnels actually leads to Ravana Falls, the widest falls in the entire country. These tunnels must have been a nice route to take for a bath in the mighty falls. Unfortunately, you can't enter any of these tunnels today, but a slightly steep climb to the top of the mountain, I missed the jungle where the cave is concealed, is so, so, so worth it. After we did all the hikes in Ella that were doable with a five-year-old, admiring the perfect geometry of tea gardens, it was time to head to the other side of the island. Our last destination was Gali, but there was one very special stop that I absolutely had to take on the way. Talking about the Dondra Head Lighthouse, one of the tallest lighthouses in Southeast Asia. It's the southernmost point of the island. Well, even leaving these facts alone, it must be the most picture-perfect lighthouse I've ever seen. My dream was to climb the lighthouse, gaze into the infinite Indian Ocean and then look back for the best view of the island. I mean, just imagine a view from there. Unfortunately, the lighthouse was closed. I was so disappointed. But well, when such things happen, I only take it as a sign that I must come back. And here we were at our last stop, Gale. Gali is most famous for its Dutch fort, which is in excellent condition. Before moving to India, I spent 10 years in Europe, and I can tell you, if you missed Europe and Asia, Gali is the place to go. Best part is that you can stay in the fort itself, which is full of small hotels for each budget. Surely we didn't miss a chance to stay in the original 500-year-old building. Gale is full of galleries and small museums, a heaven for art and culture lovers. 
When day tourists disappear back to their resorts, the tiny streets become completely empty. In the quietest corner you can even stumble upon ancestral homes, where large families still reside. Life in the fort starts early. Already at dawn it's full of locals, jogging and walking around the fortified walls, enjoying the 360-degree view of the Indian Ocean. Roaming on the walls of Gali Fort, gazing into the endless ocean, and then turning back to look at the mix of architecture from opposite corners of the world, I was thinking. This is what Sri Lanka of today is. A mix of cultures and lifestyles, a history of many countries in one, a nature paradise with the best views wherever you look, encompassed by the bluest of oceans. It doesn't matter on what age of the island you stand, you'll forever be looking into the infinity, future and hope.